Hello everyone. There are still people outside, so I hope they will come in soon. Um, I'm German, so I like to be on time. I'm sorry about this. Yeah. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce to you uh, Valerie Fossel. She's coming from Durham, and she will talk about explosion. Actually, it's funny because I saw you change your title. Uh, it turned from a dream and it disappeared. I hope it didn't become a nightmare. Um, no? Good. Sylvie. Okay, great. Job. So uh, let's welcome him. Yeah? Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. So, first of all, uh, thank you very much for the organizers. It's been a pleasure to be here. It's a nice to be here. So, I'm going to talk about explosion. I did shorten the title mostly because, you know, we're talking only about 25 minutes, so the title should be on my page. So, explosion is, uh, well, this idea in America uh, I've been involved with for the last year and a half, the couple, last couple of years. Uh, principally done in collaboration with uh, Michael Spanowski, who is my colleague in Durham, and at some stages also our students and also So there's a fair number of papers. The, the most recent one is this one in October 2018. It's actually uh, a big review of semi-classical methods. Uh, Good, so I'll try to break it up into two halves. The first half will be a little longer, the second half will be more technical and shorter. I hope I'll have enough time for it. So the, uh, the first half of the talk would be largely interpretive, dealing with the uh, already well-known and well-established results. And the second half will be non-interpretive involving uh, semi-classical manipulation. So the main idea of the explosion is I want to consider a very large number of, uh, of Higgs bosons produced, uh, uh, produced uh, in certain conditions, for example, at high energy collider or in the other universe. And the idea is to take the number of these Higgses to be parametrically larger than one over lambda, right? Or let's say, both some, some constant of four times one over lambda. So in some sense, the number of final state particles is not determined, right? It goes as one over the coupling constant. The coupling constant is two degrees weak. Right, kinematically, this is certainly possible, for example, at scattered atomic two big colliders. Kinematically, right? But we have to we have to figure out what the what the result of the rates So if uh, the incoming state, right, if I consider a subprocess where a highly virtual or highly energetic resonance was produced at the intermediate state of the reaction, right, the object we are computing is the decay rate of this highly virtual resonance uh, into n pixels. So it's gamma n of p squared, right? The decay rate or partial decay rate of the of the Higgs at high virtuality p squared going into n particles, n pixels. Right? And of course this is related uh, to the imaginary part of the cell energy. So the statement of explosion is that explosion happens when the imaginary part of the self energy at the scale p squared becomes greater than p squared or m squared itself. Right? So you will no longer be able to treat the propagators 1 over p squared minus m squared. The effects of the self energy will become critically important. And when the self energy will continue growing, and I'm planning to will grow exponentially the imaginary part of self energy, is growing p squared, the propagator will be basically shut down. So instead of 1 over p squared minus m squared, the propagator will go exponentially. So that's the main point to where I want uh, to get. So, uh, so what we can see that is essentially a non-interpretive regime where the number of particles produced is of order of the available energy square root of s over m. I'm going to work in the theory which has no massless particles. So I don't want to suffer from infrared. I don't want to have a theory which suffers from infrared divergence. So for most of them I'm going to do, I'm going to consider just a fight to the fourth uh, scale of theory in the, in, in the broken phase. So I want to look at the maximal or nearly maximal number of particles I can produce where n is of the square root of s over m. And if you go as one of the coupling constants, it should be treated as a large parameter. So this is, a, in this sense, a non-determinative problem. Uh, 
what we'll do in the first part of the talk, I'll briefly review how to do determinative calculations. Uh, so how to do what's the result for tree level, uh, for the tree level amplitudes and probabilities. And how to take into account leading all the quantum corrections, how to incorporate the rules. And uh, these results are already well known. And then I uh, will explain how to, since perturbation theory is not, is not really a, a trustable approximation in this case, and suffers from larger divergences and so on, explain how to do, how to compute quantum effects directly in the unit when n times lambda is much greater than 1. And in fact, that this, uh, this semi classical computation of quantum effects in a regime where perturbation theory is valid, between lambda n to be small, will completely reproduce the non to level and lead and loop effects. But when you go to the regime where lambda n is very large, you will get more. So that's the, that's the plan. So in general, explosion uh, re re relates to processes where in the initial state are like few particles, in the final state many particles, and many means uh, that uh, the non multiplicity of final states uh, goes faster than one of the lambda. Right. And so this can be applied to scattering process where you have two particles to n, or it can be applied to a resonance decay where you have one uh, highly virtual particle to n to, to particles. And for the purposes of this talk, I will mostly concentrate on the resonance decay. Uh, so if I'm thinking of the entire physical process, like for example, the vector boson fusion process, where from, from, from two quarks to emission of, 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 of mass effective bosons, I produce the virtual kits and then let the kits decay into a large number of kits in the final state. So I'm looking at the sub process, which is in this purple box. Right, and then you can, you can dress the process. Uh, I, I didn't propagate that to, to, to make a whole, to make a whole uh, two to end process. And then we'll have double solid So we will mostly, for a lot of time, we will mostly concentrate on this is very interesting. So we will compute or estimate the rate, which as I said is the, so for this process it, it would correspond to uh, the, the, the partial width of the decay of this resonance. It's of course the same as the imaginary part of the, uh, of the self energy, which exactly had mass. Then, when I, if I want to reconstruct the entire process, I have to add this propagator. I have to multiply the, this, this, this vertex by the propagator. The propagator is not just d squared minus an x squared, or s minus an x squared. It also involves the, uh, the self-energy in the denominator. So the same gamma which we are computing there, or this gamma sum of n, will also appear in the propagator. So actually, the entire process will not violate the entirety of this it is for this sub-process. There will be no violation of the entirety. Another problem, right? This cross-section will not grow exponentially uh, with energy because whatever whatever the large effect is coming from the rate over here for the square of the process, it would be more than compensated uh, by, by the effect of the So we are not looking for completely explosive cross-sections uh, that having seen the colliders which will dominate them now. But all we are hoping for is to be able to find something observable. Um, okay, so this I have explained. So that the, 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 the entire propagator is not just one of the piece squared minus n squared, but it must, uh, must include the state of soda. So this is a Dyson resum propagator. It's dead in this expression. The Dyson resum propagator is just a resum of the generation progression. It's not relying on the for a two point so warm up, right? Let's let's compute very quickly uh, one to n amplitude at three level, right? So all external legs are amputated, right? So all external legs are LSA amputated. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to look, um, of course, even at three level to compute one to n process, so some of our old n factorial of final diagrams is a pretty difficult task. So I'm going to look at the simplified assumption, right? Or simplified but important for us assumption that all of the, the, the number of particles produced in the final state is nearly maximum, right? So everything is massive. So the maximum number of particles you can have in the final state is when they are all <coughs> the threshold. So when uh, the amplitude is of one, only one particle mass threshold, so the n maximum will be square root of S over n. 
At this point, uh, the, the phase space over which I would have to integrate would be zero. Right, so I'm staying just before the mass threshold. So this L is going to be a little bit less than the maximum. And epsilon, in this case, is the kinetic energy of the final state per particle per mass. So when epsilon is equal to zero, I'm exactly on mass threshold, and the phase space volume is equal to zero, so I want to put an epsilon, which is small, less than one, not, not, not very far from zero. The phase space will be small, but not true. So in this regime, this amplitude has two levels of amplitude computer. And this is the, uh, this is the result, right? So the amplitude uh, goes as n factorial, lambda, which is the self-coupling of the, which is the self-coupling. Scalar, uh, lambda to the power n minus 1 over 2. And then, uh, if I was exactly on threshold, it would be times 1. And if epsilon is non, non zero, there are corrections of order n over epsilon, epsilon, and then of order epsilon. It is also known that in the regime when epsilon goes to zero and n goes to infinity, the regime of infinity for us, when I keep the parameter n epsilon fixed, this correction minus 7 over 6 n epsilon exponentially. Right, so this is the amplitude of the book. So this is the amplitude. This is the amplitude in the non in the near realistic in the non relativistic limit, right? So it has n factorial growth, uh, appropriate power of lambda, and then it has uh, an exponential factor e to the minus seven six. So now I can square the amplitude and integrate over the phase space. So because, uh, because I'm working in the uh, non-relativistic limit when n goes to infinity and epsilon is small, uh, integration of a phase space can be, can be performed with large n very straightforwardly, right? So this is just a uh, simple descent And the result for the partial width, the result for the partial width of for the amplitude squared uh, integration of a phase space divided by n factorial, keeping only the exponential factor in the game, Goes as e to the n log lambda n. That part is exactly what you have from the uh, from the two level amplitude on threshold. So because n log lambda n in the exponent is uh, is a Stirling formula approximation for n factorial. And then so this is a large positive effect when n is, is very large and say lambda n is large. And then there is a negative effect which comes from a very small volume of the phase space. So it goes as e to the n log epsilon, or 3 half n log epsilon. If I put it in front of the exponent instead, it will be epsilon, which is kinetic energy to the power 3n over 2. So this is a, uh, an epsilon is small. This is a tiny volume of the n particle phase space. So the overall effect in this leading on the three level uh, uh, approximation is the competition between the large n log lambda n factor, which is coming from n factorial, and the small uh, and the small phase space. And so you can always take the energy and n large enough, and epsilon small but fixed in such a way that the first factor will always overcome the second one. That's sufficiently large enough. So, uh, then you can add loops this formula, so this was exactly the three level effect. You cannot look, uh, you cannot look at the x and to have the long story short, uh, the, uh, the amplitude is <coughs> non-relativistic, so the amplitude for non-relativistic n particles in the final state with large n will go as a three level amplitude times the exponent of some constant lambda n squared, right? And this constant is the same constant as you obtain from the three unit in order uh, loop correction uh, to the three level amplitude. And this, this correction again is proven in the 90s to exponentially. The interesting fact is that in the theory without the web, the, the constant B is negative, and so adding the loop corrections, adding the higher loop corrections, completely destroys and suppresses the growing three level amplitude. But in the theory with the web, the B is positive, so, uh, so the, the, the lead in all the loop corrections actually, so they, they keep the same factorial growth as was present in the three level amplitude, but then they grow even faster. But then of course you have to calculate higher and higher order corrections, higher and more order loop corrections will become progressively more and more important, and that is the, 
consequence of the fact that <coughs> observation theory in the regime of interest where lambda n is much greater than 1 is, uh, is not convergent. Right? Well, and to large orders of perturbation theory. So we have to do better. So we have to do a non perturbative so very quickly, I want to uh, mention, because that's important for, for the semi-classical methods, that while we are staying at tree level, the behavior, the factorial divergence, the factorial growth of perturbative amplitudes at tree level is perfectly captured by some classical solutions. And that is a nice fact from quantum field theory, which was realized by Lowell Brown in, in 1962. So of course, when you are doing a tree level calculation, you, you set loop effects to zero, so h bar is equal to zero, and that's uh, equivalent to doing just a classical field theory. So uh, to say it more precisely, there is a classical solution which is with some appropriate initial uh, some appropriate initial conditions, which I want to describe, which actually gives you uh, a generated functional for all tree level amplitudes. Right. And so from knowing the solutions by differentiating this to source, which is z and times, you immediately derive the, uh, the, the previously shown tree level of the So classical solutions provide a generated functional called tree level of What's interesting and why I want to talk about it right now, so I want to mention that, is that classical solutions are related to perturbative contributions to the the amplitude that I just explained. Secondly, even though I'm sitting and I'm working with a real scale field theory, the solutions responsible for capturing the behavior of the amplitudes are not real, they're complex. And third property is that the solutions are singular. So you can see there's all the denominators which are complex kinds. This is all not surprising, so you should not think of these solutions that uh, these solutions really describe some, some uh, some classical waves and the process, uh, the process was described as some waves and classical field theory. You know, these solutions is what contributes to the path integral, uh, computed in the steepest descent set of point method. We deform the contours, we deform the contours in such a way that, uh, that the solution becomes complex and the solutions will also be singular. So now, so this is, uh, this is the solution. So in complex time tau, if we have so now we move into the part two of the talk. So these classical solutions so far had uh, direct correspondence just to the tree level amplitude, but that's not what we want to do. Right? We want now to do a fully non perturbative calculation in the, the semi classical approximation. Uh, and so go beyond these simple solutions. It will still have similar properties, but it's a different thing. So, so there, this, is our, this is our object. So this is a, uh, this is a probability rate. I call it here Rn of E, so it's the same as gamma, uh, the same as gamma n. So what I have to do, I have to take a matrix element for the process, and so the initial state here is approximated, and that's what's necessary for the semi-classical approach. The initial state is approximated to some local operator acting on the bubble. Then this operator is evolved, so this, this initial state is evolved with an S matrix projected on the state of energy E, and, uh, and, and then, uh, uh, and then, uh, so, so it's uh, there's a projection to the increased energy E, and there is a final state time. So this is a, uh, an initial state going to the endpoint state, right? The volume is less than the square is made to element integrate over phase space. So the um, The, the, there, there, is a, there is a standard choice for this uh, for the operator, which I can explain later. Just questions. And so now the uh, the idea is that you write down a uh, double path integral, so you can have a path integral representation for one matrix element, for the other matrix element, and multiple uh, multiple integral over the phase space. And then you compute uh, compute this uh, this rate as a multiple path integral or double path integral. Of course, we can't compute it, so this is where we need to use the semi-classical approach. So the idea is simply to compute this integral in a, in a certain point. There is a number of parameters in the problem, right? So this is not as simple semi-classical approach as if you go, for example, just computing an instant on contribution to 
through some process. Right? You do an instant diffusion, you take the microscopic action, and you find the classical solution, which is a minimum of a microscopic action. Right? Here, the whole name of the game is that we have to have the memory of the, uh, of the end particle final state. So you use a coherent space representation for the path integral in such a way that the overall exponent appearing in this double path integral knows about n. So that you are minimizing effectively some sort of effective action, which is not just a microscopic action coming from here, a microscopic action coming from here, but it also has, has n dependence in it. Right? So you have lambda which is small, you have n which is large, and so you take a uh, Lambda goes to zero, n goes to infinity, double scale in limits. Right? You want to have, at the end of the day, for simple series descent method, you want to have just one small parameter, or one large parameter. So let's say the large parameter in front of the action is n, and then you keep lambda n fixed, and uh, epsilon, uh, which is our uh, kinetic energy, is just about uh, fixed, and set lambda to zero, and n goes to infinity. So n goes as one over lambda, right? So this is the this is the semi classical uh, this is the semi classical sequence uh, descent approximation, right? And jumping ahead of time, so we are keeping lambda n fixed, and I can have lambda n to be very small, or I can have it large, right? So it's large. It's, it, it's a fixed constant, and the large can be a, a hundred if you wish, but it should be smaller than n itself. Right, so when lambda, so you, you, when you carry out this semi-classical calculation, for lambda n being small, you will completely reproduce the, the true-level perturbation here without making any connection, any, any uh, use of it, basically, together with its loop uh, error. When lambda n is large, this is where you get, uh, what's the way, where you get the new result. Right? The method is the same. The, the actual solutions and the, and the, and the, and the result and the final result for the rate, of course, is different for small and large lambda. When I work with large lambda, the corrections to the region of the semi-classical result will no longer be uh, subject to corrections of all the lambda n. They will instead go as one over lambda n, because lambda n is a large lambda So, so now this is how uh, formalism was, uh, was set up by uh, somewhere around 1994, right? And this is a formalism which, uh, which I'm going to follow. The, uh, the outcome of the formalism is that, let me summarize these four steps. You simply, so in order to find the subtle points of this, uh, of this part integral, you have to solve classical equations without source structure. You have to impose initial and final boundary conditions on the solution. So these are the conditions to what happens in the initial time and in the final time. And notice, so, so they, they arise because we know that the initials, we know the description of the initial state, that was some operator O acting on the buckle, and we know the final state, which was an n particle state. So because the initial state is essentially originated from the buckle, or its approximation to Q particles, there are only a dagger operators, there are only positive plane waves appearing in the solution when time goes to minus infinity and no negative ones. When uh, time goes to plus infinity, there are both there are both components, x to plus ikx and x to minus ikx with coefficients appropriately related to each other. Right? So you can see already here that the solutions emerging are uh, manifestly complex solutions, even though we are in the here. Uh, then you can compute the energy and the particle number and you eliminate the auxiliary parameters t in theta and you get your leading all the same possible contribution to the path integral as so our probability rate is r and sub so e. It's exponent of the function w and this is the function w. So it involves e t minus n theta uh, where e is the energy and uh, uh, is the number of particles in the final state minus the dimension, twice the imaginary part of the action. So, I'll skip, the, I'll skip some of the details, and now basically we'll present you with the, with the result of the population, 
And the result of the calculation in the semi-classical limit when lambda goes to zero, n goes to infinity, lambda n peaks n large, and actually this peaks them small, it is that uh, it is the exponent of the following expression, right? So having the exponent, uh, there is a function in uh, in parentheses here, which is often called the determinative polygrade function. It's a function of two parameters, lambda n and epsilon, right? So remember, lambda n and epsilon are treated as fixed. Lambda n will be large, epsilon will be small. But there is an overall factor in front of this function, which goes as n, or which is the same as 1 over lambda. So if this function is negative, the determinative uh, rate is exponentially suppressed. If the function is positive, then it is uh, exponentially large and, uh, uh, well, when it's positive or negative, it, its effect is always enhanced by n and right? you can you can plot the rate as a function as a function of n. So you see that uh, so there are different uh, uh, different contours for different values of the overall energy available. So for example, when the energy is 190 masses, right, very sharp transition. The, 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 maximum, uh, the maximum of this expression is somewhere around 140 for n. So n has to be already of order 140, but the, uh, I'm myself, but the overall rate is of order 10 to the minus 4, so it's very small. But then uh, for slightly higher energy, it's around already 195 masses, uh, the, the rate becomes uh, of order 100, and then it increases to the energy to 200 and then uh, the rate becomes 10 to the 4. So it's a very sharp transition between, between exponentially suppressed and exponentially large contribution to the, to the wave. Okay, so let me move to the conclusion. I have a reason to do discussion. I also have some extra slides in case there are questions. So the main object for the explosion actually is not the cross section. It's the, it's the, it's the width. It's the, it's the n particle width of a highly virtual scale, right? So the overall propagator contains the factor of, the, of this of this width. Right, so when we start, when we consider a propagator, so, so the, 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 the energy scales, so these square scales, where the width becomes large, becomes greater than these square itself, is the explosion scale, which is parametrically of order and heats over and hits over lambda times some numerical constant for the time to the two. Right, so when you are p squared much lower than the explosion scale, the propagation is the usual one, one of the p squared one the time squared. As soon as p squared reaches the explosion scale and gets, 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 gets greater than that, the, the, the effect of Gauss in the, in the, in the propagation completely dominates the effect and shuts off the propagation. So the propagation goes to zero. Right, so uh, the, our kind of physics interpretation of it is that the, uh, this, this propagating this resonance, when it's at very high virtualities, mm -hmm. it's extremely rapidly decays into, into soft copies of the, of the same state. Right? So the, the highly virtual case, or actually anything which is coupled to the case, will decay into large numbers of cases. Uh, with, with momentum squared around their mass squared. So in some sense, uh, it can be treated, uh, in highly virtual heat can be treated as a composite state made out of soft copies of itself. Now, the, as a consequence of the explosion, this doesn't apply to the heat itself. It applies as soon as you come up with this, uh, with this argument for the heat, or for the scale, if it was just a scalar field theory, the same type of growing contributions to the energy will be introduced to all particles coupled to the peak. So, for example, if you had a top core, so this is a top core propagation, and then you can have uh, uh, emissions of Higgs bosons from the, from, from the top line, and then this, uh, uh, these things will continue branching and branching and so on. So basically, any particle, top is now what you said, it's, uh, anything, even the graviton will explode, will explode as soon as the coupled to the peak. <coughs> So at energies greater than the explosion scale, we basically end up with a classical theory. So if you look at the coupling constants starting from the infrared, so they started from the infrared, they start running like in the ordinary perturbative standard model, 
Then they reach an explosion scale where the propagators and the loop shut down, and all the couplings flatten out. Right. Stop running. So you never reach one down poles. If there were one down poles for the for the lambda of the Higgs, you never reach the uh, one down poles for your covers. Uh, it addresses a hierarchy problem in the sense that uh, you cannot have contributions to um, uh, you cannot have contributions to uh, to the from the range of connections to the Higgs boson mass from any of highly virtual states because the propagators at the square uh, greater than an explosion scale, the move propagators just, just fine. Okay, so and I'll I'll stop here, I think I run out. Thank you. For a very interesting talk, so yeah, questions. Yeah, can I understand this in terms of something like a vessel for Golikov transformation in, in the slide? Right? When lambda is small, you have the standard uh, three level result, you say? Yes. If lambda n is small. And then when lambda n is big, then you have uh, some mixing of the, of the wave function, which uh, you, you get some. So is it uh, like uh, you go to a different vacuum when you go to a uh, large uh, lambda n? Is it uh, like all sine sine condensate vacuum? And, and so, uh, classical way. Okay, I didn't think about it in terms of vacuum, but the, the nature of the classical solution changes. Yeah. The formalism is the same. The parameter which I can continuously vary is lambda n. And basically, the, uh, the classical solution which is dominated in the path integral itself gets deformed when you are changing the lambda n. Yeah, so it's a So, and, and, then, uh, and, and then you can reach a large lambda n. Um, Reproducing like this. The key point is that uh, the, the the exponential growth in the expression persists. The growth is smaller than uh, uh, from the naively uh, from the naively interpreted tree level result. Because we remember the tree level result, in addition to n factorial, had also e to the n times lambda n corrections. So it had power-like corrections in lambda n. This so the effect of the loops. Here, the corrections uh, in the large lambda n limit are only a square root of lambda n. So uh, the, the growth is uh, a little slower uh, than, than, uh, than uh, in naively exponential perturbation theory, but it's, uh, it's still there. Does the, does the current measurement of the x decay with actually limit the number of n? Oh, okay, that is that. Does the current measurement of Higgs decay with limit the number of n. So you need to have uh, you need to have a very large energy, right, of p squared, in order to reach uh, to reach uh, the large n, right. So n maximum can be uh, n maximum can be only square root of s uh, over m, right. So this effect become important where n is of order hundred or hundred and fifty. So we by very far don't have enough energy to get a, at the moment, even anywhere close to it. But, but the interesting fact is that you would probably naively expect, have expected that problems of scalar field theories related to Landau holes or other issues that right, start with much higher energies than work explosions. Right? You would certainly not expect it to be in, in some tens to hundreds of TV. Um, so is the result, does it change if you include other standard model coupling, for instance? In no, the result, the result would be modified, of course, right? The result would be modified, uh, but uh, we don't expect that, the, that it will be completely changed. Right? So the calculation, so this uh, kind of non-trivial semi-classical calculation was carried just for the scale of field of all, where we switched off the couplings to W bosons to all the works, right, so this doesn't decay to DB bar pairs. So. so that will all have to be taken into account. In semi classical approach, it's not an entirely trivial task. In perturbation theory, this effect could be added straightforwardly without a change to the main result, that right? numbers will change. But, uh, but then perturbation theory is not really trusted. So we expect that this would all hold uh, for, uh, for, for the full standard model. There's now this very fantastic question about uh, high orders of perturbation theory and whether it's uh, 
uh, is the problem of it. I'll just very quickly comment on this. Okay? So you could say, so you could say, okay, so you talked about uh, systemic classical methods for a while, so fine. Let's go back to perturbation theory, right? So I said that you cannot trust directly what you get to perturbation theory, but nevertheless in perturbation theory you can at least understand where did the where did the growth of the perturbative results come from? The growth of perturbative results came from essentially the n factorial factor in front of the amplitude. The n factorial factor came from the fact that there was approximately n factorial final diagrams contributing to this process. Right? Should we completely disregard this whole thing and say this is the, the growth you are finding is because of the large orders of perturbation theory? Okay? So first comment like to make. Right? So, we are, so the, what we are confusing here is the imaginary part of the self-energy where we are existing that we have exactly n paths. Right? So we are cutting exactly n lines and n is large in the imaginary part of the self-energy. Okay? So all these particles are on the shelf. So would you have a factorial growth of this process, for example, if you computed it in QCD? Right? There should be factorial growth in QCD would want to an amplitude factorially divergent in CT? The answer is probably not. Because, for example, MHE amplitude is too negative for positive helicities. In color, relatively in the color space, they just have one term in that, right? So the offshore quantity, and of all the n factorial contributions coming in it, and it was an overall n factorial uh, factor. But when you, when you took the quantity on mass shell, uh, there were major constellations caused by going on much so. So scalar is very special. The scalar is very special because uh, in the scalar case, of this, because for example, the pure phi to the fourth theory, there will, there will be no individual constellations between different diagrams. Not offshore, not offshore. The second comment I want to make is that usually we amputate perturbation theory, so if I was confusing some uh, perturbative contributions, higher and higher order contributions to some quantity, which I call the sigma, and this is n along the horizontal axis, what I would normally expect is that first that uh, higher and higher order contributions to this quantity become smaller, I reach some critical value, and then I go above that, and, uh, and I start getting greater and greater contributions from perturbation. Right? The series is divergent, you have to go really sum it if you can, usually you can't, so we usually stop over there. What I'm confusing is a finite quantity. Right, so it's a massive theory. So gamma n, I'm summing over n, so I'm summing over all possible number of paths over there, and the maximum number of paths is a maximum, and I cannot go beyond that. So even in perturbation theory, I'm summing over gamma n's, where gamma n's have this fault. So it's actually a finite quantity, maybe a large, but it's a finite quantity. I don't believe that the arguments about Borel resummation and the symptotic nature of perturbation theory should be applied should be applied to the quantities, which are actually finite, which are not very right. But So I think it provides an interesting perspective on it. But in general, you can also forget about all of that, because I'm saying that at the end of the day, I'm making use of the creation theory for more than just the materials. <coughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for me, gamma n is physical quantity. It's a decay wave. Right? So some people argue saying that this is not physical, but it's a, uh, I mean, this formula you can define it as a physical QFT observer. But the, but the cross-section, right, when gamma explodes exponentially, it doesn't mean that the cross-sections and scattering processes will, because you have to start reusing the same gamma n in the proper case. I'm sorry, but we should move on. This is less than a grand speaker.